Good afternoon and welcome to the Institute for Government. My name is Nick Davies and I'm a programme director here. On behalf of the Institute and Autogen AI, who have kindly partnered with us on this event, thank you very much for joining this discussion on what artificial intelligence means for government procurement. Generative AI, that is, artificial intelligence that creates new content using machine learning algorithms, is improving incredibly fast. With the latest iterations making light work of written assessments on everything from history and maths to literature and even wine, uh, this has major implications for procurement, which accounts for around a third of total government spending. Writing bids for contracts takes time, investment and resources currently. But by enabling suppliers to create bid text more quickly, Generative AI will likely lead to more firms bidding for more contracts. Uh, this could lower the barriers to entry for suppliers that may otherwise lack the resources to apply for government contracts, leading to more competition and better outcomes for government. But it's also likely to mean that government is having to process a larger volume of bids and creates the risk of suppliers submitting more speculative bids due to the lower effort required. So what impact will reducing the bureaucratic burden of bid writing have on suppliers? Will this help government secure better value for money through procurement? What can government do to prepare for a higher volume of bids? And what are the possible downsides of increased use of generative AI in the procurement process? To discuss these questions and more, I'm delighted to be joined by a brilliant panel. Uh, we have Sean Williams, the Chief Executive of Autogen AI. Uh, Aina Ben Yehuda, the Chief Commercial Officer at the Department of uh, Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Uh, we have Kate Stedman, uh, the Group Strategy and Communications Director for Serco. Sally Guy, Global CEO of World Commerce and Contract. And finally, Richard Allen, Member of the House of Lords. Each of our speakers will make a brief opening remarks. I will then ask a, a follow-up question to each of them before taking questions from the audience, both here in person and online. If you have a question for any of our panelists, then please do raise your hands if you're in the room or submit them using the Q&A function if you are watching remotely. And please do give your name when doing so. You can submit questions online while we're speaking and we'll try to get through as many as possible. Finally, we will be live tweeting from the at IFG events account uh, and please do tweet along using the hashtag IFG procurement. Right, without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to our first speaker, Sean Williams, Chief Executive of Autogen AI. Fantastic. Thank you and uh, welcome everyone. Great to see so many people here. Uh, just for the people in the room, can I have a quick show of hands? Who's used generative AI? Say something like ChatGPT. I'm gonna take a show of hands. So that's probably two thirds of the room, uh, I think. Um, which I think shows you, because when we started talking about generative AI to people 18 months ago, we would get these enormous uh, sort of blank faces. Uh, so since sort of ChatGPT in November really of last year, we've seen this increasing acceleration in the public consciousness. Um, and large language models are going to change everything. They're the most exciting technology since the, uh, since the internet. We think that innovation is about speeding things up. If you think the abacus, the abacus speeded up adding up a multiplication and that made complex trade possible. You think about the printing press, it speeds up the sharing uh, of ideas. You think about the steam engine, it speeds up the powering of uh, factories and, and, and turbochargers, the industrial revolution. The internet speeds up the sharing of ideas. Um, generative AI, large language models, speed up the creation of ideas. So, I'm actually not gonna answer the first question, what does, um, uh, what does generative AI mean for government procurement? Because I'm actually just gonna ask a large language model. So we're gonna, and so we're just gonna type this in. Uh, so Harry uh, is very kindly um, uh, helping me out here. So, and, and we haven't done this, this is a large language model, we're just asking it. It's, it's a general large language model, so it's not been trained on anything specific about government procurement. Um, it has read everything that's ever been written. It's got 175 billion parameters. If you or I were to try and read the same amount of text, it would take us 120,000 years. Um, so we'll see what it comes up with. Uh, the UK government could use artificial intelligence to streamline its procurement process by using AI-powered predictive analytics to inform decisions and identify cost savings. I think that's probably a good idea. Might be a good idea, might not be a bad idea. This isn't searching anywhere. This isn't, f people often say, where's it getting its information from? It's not finding 
information. It's generating it. It's randomly picking words to follow other words based on its semantic understanding that it's built from essentially having read everything that's, that's ever been written, that's been, um, that's been digitized. So again, we've got automated bidding process to simplify and speed up the procurement process. That sounds pretty good. AI analytics to identify cost savings. That sounds pretty good. Improved risk management and compliance. That sounds pretty good. Uh, maybe we don't like the next idea. AI doesn't have any um, AI doesn't have any judgment, so we need our humans. It can very quickly come up with content and ideas. We use judgment, uh, and then from from the things that it's given us, we can uh, we can very quickly ask the AI to write an entire speech for us in uh, in in this area. So, if you haven't seen generative AI before, what machines can now do is remarkable. We are very, very used to computers being able to add up faster than us. We are not used to computers being able to write faster than us, and, and not just a little bit faster than us, thousands, tens of thousands of times faster than us. What does that mean for, for procurement? Um, look, I mean, this technology is going to transform the world, but some of the things I think that it will specifically do for government procurement is it will drive down the cost of organisations tendering for government contracts. 300 billion spent on outs outsourced services in the UK. We estimate about 10% of that is spent on the cost of competition. That's 30 billion pounds on the cost of competition. Technology which speeds can drastically reduce that cost, leading to greater competition, greater innovation, lower cost for the taxpayer. I'm sure we'll have a slightly more rounded view. Obviously, I come from a particular <laughs> kind of um, perspective, but those, those would be my assisted opening remarks. Brilliant, thank you. I'm going to come next to Einar ben Yehuda, Chief Commercial Officer at DEFRA. Hello, everyone. I uh, hope everyone is well. Really, really pleased to be here with you. So um, I work for DEFRA. I also work for the Government Commercial Organization, which we affectionately call uh, a GCO. Um, so what do we care about? So in DEFRA, we're very passionate about partnership. Um, and there are three main ways we partner. We partner through contracts, so we're going to talk about this today. You've already mentioned uh, how potentially AI can um, make that more efficient. We also increasingly award grants, and grants is all about how we uh, fund outcomes that we really care about. And in DEFRA, we, of course, care about the environment. We also care about farming and, and other areas. We also increasingly collaborate so that's where we jointly deliver outcomes that, again, we care about with partners. Um, this technology, as well as other technologies we're currently looking at, um, we care about them, but uh, what we mostly care about are the outcomes. So a number of things we care about. First of all, how is, how is this going to enable us, as well as our partners, to be more efficient? You mentioned cost. I'd like to also understand quality and whether that's going to um, uh, improve or not. Um, I'd like uh, to better understand how it could be making government more efficient. Um, we're notorious in putting barriers. We'd like to reduce them. Um, very interested in how can this help with fairness of competition. Uh, you've alluded to it. Uh, and of course, we're interested in sustainability. But, so there are advantages here. We're also very alive to the fact that any technology, including this one, could be misused. So we'd like to understand what are the risks involved and how are they going to be mitigated? And we're part of the solution for, for that. So I'm gonna stop there and the, the rest we can continue in the debate and discussion. Brilliant, thank you. I'm going to come next to Kate Stedmung, um, Group Strategy and Commercial Communications Director for Serco. <laughs> thank you very much, and really pleased to be here with such a panel and uh, with everyone, everyone listening. So thank you. Um, Serco describes itself as an impact partner to governments, and we work across the world in about 20 countries, delivering only public services, partnering to deliver technology uh, with people-led services. So I really welcome the discussion today. I think it's hugely exciting and really, really important. Um, and they say it's always important to begin um, with a joke. Um, and, and being absolutely useless at humor, I, I thought I would ask ChatGPT um, for a joke on AI and government procurement as a small uh, test case of capability. Uh, and, and forgive me for, for using a, a competitor platform. So, uh, and, and, um, and the joke came back as follows. Why did the AI cross the road? 
um, answer to get to the government procurement office and ensure its algorithm was selected for the next big project. <laughs> so I, I think it's fair to say that when it comes to humour, there's a bit of a way to go when it comes to um, AI, um, even if it's still much better than my own jokes and has saved me. Um, but regardless of there being more, more work required in some areas, AI is here in government procurement already, some countries more so than others, and be it embedded in the actual goods and services that procurement's designed to procure, or embedded in the procurement processes itself, it's going to have an absolutely massive impact going forward. And I just want to talk about that in, in three ways, um, if that's all right. So the first thing is that artificial intelligence it's got real, it's here, and it's here to stay, as far as I'm concerned. Be it governments or the private sector ramping up, we can see that in the UK in 2021, obviously a few years ago, 4.65 billion of private investment in AI companies, making it the first in Europe and in the world. In the US, we're already seeing some federal contracting authorities using AI to optimize their processes, for example, the Department of Homeland Security. Adoption of AI has more than doubled since 2017. 63% of UK employees say they expect their organisation's investment in AI to increase over the next three years. And according to uh, a consultancy I won't name, high-performing chief procurement officers are 18 times more likely to have fully developed AI capabilities. So it's here and it's here to stay. And my other two points focus on really what are the positives we see from this and what are the potential risks and negatives. And when it comes to the positives, I think they are obviously significant when it comes to public services themselves, be it the remote monitoring of patient, patients, um, alleviating capacity from hospitals, facial recognition in prisons, detecting when violence is about to occur and therefore um, allowing early intervention, and the examples go on and on. But I want to focus obviously a bit on procurement specifically and tendering, which I think we'll be focusing on um, much today. And I think the first thing, and it's already been mentioned, is actually is that we see it opening the door to major cost reductions for bidders, which is only a good thing. And I think the latest research I could find showed that the UK actually has the most pub expensive public procurement process in the world, um, with the average full procurement costing about £45,000 a year, and with £8,000 of those costs being borne by the public sector rather than the supplier. So, um, reducing costs, purely a good thing, right? Because it means we can have more competition. And we also know that when you introduce competition into public services, that has, on average, a cost saving of between 5 and 15% without, on the whole, impacting quality, um, which, which, again, is really important when we're talking about the impact we want to achieve, which is good value services at high quality um, for the taxpayer. We also know that competition has been declining um, in public services in the UK. So I think it's in 2013, it was just 4% of public tenders had only one supplier respond. But when we went to 2020, that increased to 23%. So the importance of keeping up competitive tension is really, really critical. And as been mentioned earlier, uh, it will also allow suppliers, big and small, to be involved. I mean, that's a really important priority for all governments and for society, allowing charities and SMEs to be more active in the bidding process. There's been massive progress made in that in recent years, but I think there's more we can do. So I think overall, we see these really positive tendencies, but there's no pain without, without gain and no gain without pain. So what are the risks? And I suppose it's best summarized in my mind is that artificial intelligence requires increasingly intelligent buyers and must never replace the human judgment. So firstly, I think the first point is that there's a difference between complex public services being procured and simple goods. It's very different buying a prison management system than it is buying a paperclip. And when it comes to those complex public services, we need artificial intelligence, but it must not be a replacement for genuine capability. And if we are auto-generating bidding responses, how do we ensure that that authentic capability lies behind those words? And as a result of that, I think it's likely that past performance of suppliers is going to become more and more important. And therefore, paradoxically, on the converse, we've got to be careful that that requirement for past performance and genuine ability to be able to appoint at having previously delivered a service doesn't come around and therefore actually inhibit new entrants, the very opposite of what we're trying, we're trying to achieve. Uh, the second point under the risks is that the technological skills of, of government officials. 
on both sides of suppliers and government, if, if we're going to use this technology effectively, the skill base has got to keep up with it. And I think that's a challenge on all, all sides. When it comes to innovation, how do we ensure that we don't have a cookie cutter approach to, um, to all proposals generated um, lacking, you know, leading to um, a decline in innovation and genuinely new thought in public service delivery. And then, of course, we've got all the obvious, typical risks associated with AI, be it ethics, data security, legal concerns. And I think we're going to see increasing regulation around this and what form that takes will be really interesting. And it's coming up in different forms in different countries already. But to the final really point that underlines all this is, for me, that AI must augment but not replace human insight, especially when we consider what we're trying to achieve, which is ultimately better human outcomes for citizens, better public services for taxpayers. So thank you. Thank you, Kate. Uh, now to Sally Guy, Global CEO of World Commerce and Contracting. Thank you. I'm not going to start with a joke. That was a good <laughs> I like that. Um, I, uh, so Sean asked the question I was going to ask. So there's quite a few of you in the room that have used generative AI. Um, how many of you believe that, because AI has, as Kate Riley said, it's been around for a while. Um, this is not new news. But how many of you believe that we're at an inflection point now? Yeah, OK. I do too, for what it's worth. Um, and I think what's really fascinating and why I think we're at an inflection point is because suddenly this has been brought to the user. This is the, te the technology is now inclusive. It's, it's been brought to the desktop. We can all use it in a way that wasn't possible before. And I think that's um, a really important point to make. Um, I think, and I'm an optimist when it comes to the use of AI in procurement and the use of AI more broadly, very much an optimist. Um, but of course, there has to be caution with that optimism. Um, you know, I'd also say that we don't necessarily need um, emerging and leading technology like AI to address the complexity of public procurement. Um, there are some things that we can do mm. manually to address the complexity of public procurement. So I think, again, we need to make sure that we're, we're balancing this. But you know, this does have the power to um, shift the, the gear as far as um, improvement is concerned and efficiency. Um, I think it's also very important to, and you know, Nick, we talk about the, the definition of procurement and what we really mean by that. Um, this technology has the power to support outcomes. Um, it's not just technology that's going to improve the procurement process. And if you're like me, um, a, a believer in the fact that procurement is an element of a broader contracting life cycle, it's also very important to remember and to recognize that this technology can support through that life cycle, through the life of the contract in things like obligation extraction um, and management. So with all of that, I would say one of the fundamental issues that we have with the use of AI is mindset. Um, and I quote Martin Kavats, who's the national digital advisor in Estonia. And Estonia is cited as one of the leading countries in um, digital services for, for, for government. Um, and he says, success in digital services is not fundamentally about the technology much more importantly, our mindset and building a culture of trust. We've got to see ourselves now and civil servants, he was talking about as enablers. Um, we need to move away from the male gray suited images, and I quote him, not myself. Um, and of course, this can't be achieved overnight. Um, and mindset, I, I found that quote and, and it heartened me because mindset is something that I believe in. It, it's so critical, it's so important. Um, we have to believe that this is an inflection point. We have to start embracing and using this technology in order to actively address um, all of the potential negatives um, around it as well. So. Um, the world is definitely speeding up. And I think my final point then as well, and I think perhaps reiterate some of what's already said, along with mindset comes capability. 
Um, and if government is going to use this technology effectively, uh, then it needs to do two things. It needs to create positive partnerships with experts in the field because we don't need a government that is simply expert in AI, but we do also need to have a baseline capability, um, a baseline expertise in artificial intelligence, and we really need to think about the way we buy technology. Um, so that's my opening thoughts. Thanks, Nick. Thank you. And now finally to Rich Allen, member of the House of Lords. <laughs> Thanks. I can give uh, <clears throat> more of a um, political perspective, perhaps. And of course, of course, the trouble with political jokes is the frequency with which they get elected. <laughs> uh, um, that, that aside, uh, I think I want to sort of build on Anav's comments, just thinking about what we want from a government um, public procurement side. And it is that you want a pool of people providing your services that do it at a fair price, right, at the right quality, that they're sustainable, they, they make uh, healthy but not excessive margins so they can stay in the business and you can keep doing business with them over years. Uh, you don't want any lock-in, you want a pool uh, of people competing continually. And then there are other factors like, like the sort of classic ESG, uh, uh, environmental, social and governance factors that you want to build in. So what we're looking for from procurement is something that delivers that kind of market. And, and I think we're here because we have built a market that is very frictionful. And um, friction sometimes has a purpose. The, the, the lowest friction way of me having access to my house is to have no lock on the door, but I accept a certain amount of friction. I'll put a lock and I need to maintain a key. If the police want to go into my house, there's a whole other layer of friction where they need to get a court order and so on. So friction is functional in, in lots of systems that we build. In the procurement system, I think the friction primarily has two functions. The first is to keep out people who can't deliver what it is you're bidding for or will do it badly. Mm -hmm. And the second is to make sure the process is fair or at least appears to be fair if anyone challenges it in court. So I think the friction has those two sort of primary functions, uh, uh, sorting for quality uh, uh, or at least ability to deliver and, and defensively, I think, actually making sure that um, you can defend your, your procurement exercise. I think there is a different model that you can do, which is I describe more as matchmaking. And I think it's where the AI gets really exciting. And matchmaking is much more a process of trying to make sure that the, the people who are coming in and, and offering the services are the right kind of people. It's more of an iterative process. And I think AI can be useful in a, on both sides. I, I can see an incredible use, which is, look, asking AI to go out and find all those businesses who are not bidding today, but should be bidding. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it can help us to expand the pool of people who are not getting there at the moment. And then when a business has AI, it shouldn't be using gendered AI to, to create, a, you know, give me the text that will fool these people into giving me the contract. <laughs> what it should be doing is actually in that process, it should say, the first question should be, is this contract right for me as a business? And sometimes the AI will say, ha, 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 like, no way, mate. And, and sometimes it'll say, you should absolutely do this. You, you could do it. You, you should go for it. So we should be using the systems to improve that matchmaking process. That opens up a whole bunch of questions that are different, and particularly on this fairness aspect, because a matchmaking process is very different from one where you create a bunch of hurdles that you can judge objectively, and then people fall by the wayside. But I think they're worth examining, because I think they're much more likely to get us to what I want as a politician and, and somebody sort of from the public sector side to this healthy market of as many people as possible c competing uh, and, and delivering the kind of value that we want. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to ask each of the panellists a question. Um, if you are watching online, please do submit some questions while I'm doing so. Sean, I want to come to you first. Um, you said um, the model is trained on 175 billion different things. Yeah, yeah. I wonder, is there anything else that you train it on specific to the supplier or the buyer that means it's not just kind of generic or kind of all the information out there, it's something specific to that buyer or supplier as well? Yes, so when we train our models, um, we're training them not just on uh, all publicly available um, data, but for each customer that we work with, because we've got a very specific use case in procurement and, uh, and tendering, uh, we'll train it on an organisation's previous winning bids, on their target operating models, on their policies, on their procedures. So um, you, you might have heard with large language models, one of the, the challenges is hallucination. Um, what, what my business, um, because we talked about hallucination long before people were talking about hallucination, we used to call it the Boris Johnson problem, um, which was that large language models can sound superficially very impressive, but what they're saying is not necessarily true. Um, so 
it's very important that we ground, and actually to the point around competition, we, we don't want to create a system that creates plausible sounding nonsense to win government procurement because that's not going to be sustainable. We want to create a system that very quickly allows you to put your best self forward through your data, through your case studies, through your evidence, which then allows government to make a much better decision about who the correct uh, supplier is for them. I uh, look forward to the first uh, opportunity in the AI model has to apologise to the Privileges Committee for misleading the House. <laughs> um, Einav, I wondered if you could um, talk a bit more about what um, DEFRA are doing, but also the kind of government commercial organisation as a whole, to what extent they're kind of thinking about this on a department basis or kind of across the whole of, of Whitehall about how to prepare for this and, and what that looks like? Look, it's a good, it's a good question. Um, I would say we're in discovery mode, mm -hmm. frankly. Um, I think it, it's not a new technology, but it's, it's reasonably new, actually, in this space. Um, it's, it's certainly not something that we use wholesale. And I'd, I'd like us to look at, at this from two directions. And I've mentioned if, uh, efficient government. First of all, yes, we've started talking about how suppliers can potentially use it. Um, I'd like us to better understand how government can potentially use it to, for example, create bids, mm -hmm. uh, which is a highly resource intensive type process. Uh, and it's always, it's always been that way. Can we use technology, including AI, to do that? But in order for us to do that, um, both on the supplier and us, uh, for uh, its government perspective, we're going to have to look at our processes. We're going to have to simplify them. And that's something that a lot of the time we forget to do, I think, on both sides. Because um, in order to automate something, you're going to have, well, ideally you should simplify it first and then automate it. Otherwise, you, you're kind of automating a rather messy, uh, disparate um, type of process, which I don't think is going to deliver the efficiencies that we all hope this would help us deliver. Now, what do I mean by discovery more? We started talking to suppliers. Um, and some of the things that have already been said here is what we're hearing. So what we're hearing is that um, we don't anticipate, or our suppliers don't anticipate, that this will be replacing bid writing. Uh, they're seeing it as uh, supplementing it, maybe making it easier. Um, but uh, they don't feel, and I, I agree until I've seen something uh, more sophisticated, uh, they don't see that, for example, the more complex type purchases or bids can be completely replaced by this. Um, I would say that the more commoditized type items Possibly, I will say that a more preliminary type of um, or preliminary uh, elements of the process, maybe the request for information, for example, which ten tends to be quite simple. And the whole point of it is to create a threshold for suppliers to be able to prove that they've got the right capability and capacity. And they tend to be quite commoditized. And suppliers do complain, and I agree with them many times, that uh, uh, many of us, many authorities ask the same questions and we ask it more than once. Mm. So that type, this technology based on data mining, I think can just, okay, I've done this before, I can just redo this much quickly. So I can see there's a lot of opportunity in, the, in that type of space. Um, can you replicate things like culture, which we, is very important for bids, especially for high value, high complexity, where supplies are normal, the, the, the the ones that are more capable um, would look to understand what is it that we're trying to get. What's our culture? How do I match that culture? Or can I match that culture? Uh, how do I represent my capability in the best possible way? These are softer skills, and I'd, I'd love to see if technology can, can replicate it. But also, I'll be scared, frankly, <laughs> when that happens. Uh, yeah, if that, if, well, yeah. but, but, but. It, 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 can it, it can it represents that culture in an accurate way? Because for, for me, when I buy something, I want to know that this actually represents the organization as opposed to what the software told the organization to say, um, which I know universities are struggling with uh, in, in a completely different sphere. So if someone is applying for university, is that the person applying or is it some, some, some AI that told them to write 
something in a particular way. So we are in discovery mode, but we need to get there. Uh, uh, we know, and 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 we, and we we will do. We need to understand the technology better. I'd like us to partner with both the, if you like, software providers, but also with suppliers, and keep that conversation mm, going. Yeah. Thank you, um, Sally. I want to come to you next. We were talking amongst us in the in the green room beforehand about how government doesn't have the, the best track record in general at responding quickly to, to regulate new technologies when they're widespread. And we talked about, you know, it's basically two decades of social media and we're still kind of thinking about how, how we respond to it. <laughs> um, you mentioned uh, Estonia. I wonder if you could say a bit more about which kind of countries around the world have thought most about this, both in how they respond to a greater volume of AI generated bids and those that have thought about how they can deploy AI in their own systems internally, either to assess those bids or uh, create uh, uh, the process. Yeah, absolutely. And, it, and it's interesting, actually, because we, we talked a lot about this with government um, in the context of the procurement bill as well. Um, and actually, our view is that um, a, a look east is actually better than a look west. Um, that said, you know, the, the, Kate's absolutely right that the US is doing quite Im impressive things and um, Department of Health and Human Services, um, <coughs> uh, the General Services Administration as well um, ha had an interesting project and, and Canada has used um, artificial intelligence uh, and machine learning, natural language processing to analyze over 7,000 of their agreements, you know, and I think that it's when you, if you think about case studies like that and you say, okay, well, they were able to analyze this portfolio of 7,000 agreements, which when you stack them up were as tall as a 12-story building, no human is going to, or even group of humans, is going to be able to run that analysis. So this technology brings a capability beyond human capability. Um, and I, and I think that's the, the really important thing to remember. Um, so yes, I, I mentioned Estonia, um, and certainly there's some interesting things going on there. Um, Singapore has an e-procurement portal called GBiz. They've done um, a, a lot of work, I, I think, equally. The Middle East, Saudi have um, Etimad, Dubai have a smart Dubai procurement as well. But I think probably my, my favorite case study is um, the Republic of Korea and they've got a system called CONEPS. Um, and uh, that has had, and I think, again, it's important to think about outcomes. Um, you know, uh, one of, uh, another quote, you know, there's no point in investing in technology unless it's gonna solve a problem or it adds value. Um, so the, the really nice thing about um, monitoring the evolution of CONEPS is, is the impact that it's having. So, it's had um, now 75.6% of total procurement spend is awarded to small to medium enterprise through the evolution of that CONEPS tech, um, platform. It's increased transparency, it's enhanced efficient, uh, efficiency and um, cost savings. You know, we've all been talking about cost savings. Um, from a savings perspective, the last data that was shared um, savings for the government itself, $1.4 billion, US dollars, but savings for businesses, which, you know, and Kate, you, you talk about the cost associated with uh, responding to, to tenders. The, the savings through CONEPS for businesses, $6.6 .6 billion. So, you know, this has had really positive impact. Um, so I think there are a lot there are a lot of existing case studies. Uh, we are not first to market. That said, you know, we are, the, many of us are still in discovery mode. Um, but I think it is incredibly important for us to raise our heads and look at what is happening elsewhere in the world and, and take lessons from countries that arguably have been, um, you know, more uh, bold, I guess. <laughs> Kate. Are Serco still in discovery mode uh, with the use of this, or are you deploying it already? I think the whole sector is in discovery mode, and um, you know I'm not going to talk about details about how we do things, apart from that it's always within the rules. Um, I think any company operating the sector who wasn't looking at the possibilities of this technology 
uh, would not be smart. Um, but as, as I addressed earlier, I think there are multiple risks with it. And we're very proud that the services, going back to a couple of points made earlier, you know, we're, we see ourselves as a values led organisation. We're very strong in our values. We think our culture is quite unique and we don't, want to, we don't want to lose that. And again, going back to prior points, the services we deliver are relatively really quite complex services where I think it is harder to automate without, you know, how do you automate the, you know, um, the care of mentally ill patients within an immigration detention centre, for example, or the bid proposal that is, is addressing that. So I think we're in quite complex services where, where um, it's harder to do so. But I think for those areas where, again, we're talking about standard questions or standard responses, although we try to be as bespoke as we possibly can, where it's going to give government the outcomes it wants, but it's going to enable both government and supplier to save, save costs, then we should definitely, definitely be doing that. Thank you. And um, Richard, finally, I wanted to come to you. Um, there's clearly been like quite a lot of criticism about uh, poor transparency in government procurement yeah. processes, particularly over the pandemic. In a world where suppliers are bidding supported by AI and government might be using AI to partly assess that, how can government maintain public trust in the procurement process? Yeah, I mean, I mean I'm um, anyway at the sort of uh, transparency, uh, in the transparency wing of the transparency party. So just, just <laughs> like to sort of position that. And I think the more that's out there, the better in terms of us being able to assess this. Uh, and, and again, this is one of the areas I think that is potentially very contentious as we move into this world, that if you, I think you have to redefine how you're going to assess fairness in a world that's, a say, more iterative matchmaking process rather than a jumping over hurdles and seeing who falls by the wayside kind of process. I think there's a huge public interest in new people coming into the market, having data, much richer data about what the last lot of people that won the bids did and how much it cost them, and that's super sensitive. But again, from a pure public interest point of view, um, I think the more information there is about what went well, what didn't go well, the better. I think that should certainly feed into government's process and structuring of, of bids, because again, I look at the NHS in particular, and there is this repeated pattern of, you know, hundreds of millions, hundreds of, millions of pounds spent on NHS tech that fails. And, uh, and the answer may be that we should have had 20 contracts for 10 million pounds each, um, but we didn't do that because it was more difficult. Now, again, if the data shows that 20 contracts for 10 million pounds are better, then that's what we should do. But it's really hard at the moment uh, because the government holds to itself everything that happened, maybe partly out of embarrassment, but uh, everything that happened with the old contracts. So, uh, I, you know, from a pure public interest, I think far more transparency. And uh, uh, I wouldn't hold back, even though I know from a supplier point of view, they're going to say that makes life more difficult. Kind of tough from my, my point of view. That should be one of the conditions of bidding is that you are willing to be much more open. Yeah. And government equally needs to be much more open rather than waiting for the National Audit Office to haul them out in three years time. <laughs> I'd rather know like now if a procurement fails so that we don't do the same procurement next year. But. Thank you. Okay, I'm now going to um, open up to some questions from the audience, first for those in person. Um, so put up your hand if you have a question. Can I please ask you to keep your questions short? Please ensure that they aren't, in fact, statements. Uh, and please, could you say your name and where you are from? And there will be a roving mic coming around. Uh, so we'll go question here at the front first. Do let me know if there's others who'd like to come in. Hello, my name's Jack Richardson. I'm a freelance journalist um, working in, uh, in industrial participation. Um, you talk about, um, this is mainly in the context of UK government procurement, but what impact do you think, if any, AI, AI will have when it comes to uh, bringing in companies from overseas to do more technical projects, such as the controversial Ajax light tank and HS2 uh, rolling stock? Right, well, Sean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come to you first uh, on that, and I. I think we were going to put that to the AI. <laughs> so, okay, so uh, what impact might artificial intelligence have on encouraging overseas suppliers to tender for UK government work? Now, I, I might suggest, if you haven't seen just how creative these models are, now, I'd say to you that's not an easy question to answer because I haven't got a clue what I was going to say about it. So, um, 
so fortunately, uh, uh, I've got something far smarter than me. And by the way, this isn't looking up answers. So it isn't finding these answers anywhere. It's generating them, right? You know, kind of. So, um, so AI can be used to automate the process of identifying which overseas suppliers bid as best suited. So that was actually <laughs> to the point earlier. AI can be used to identify and address any language cultural barriers that might be preventing overseas suppliers from tendering for UK government work. Uh, AI can be used to analyse past successful bids from overseas suppliers in order to identify uh, trends and best practices that can be applied to future tenders. Uh, AI can be used to create a matchmaking system between UK government departments and overseas suppliers. You can Google all those ideas. If you Google those sentences, those sentences don't exist anywhere on the internet. Yeah. It's generative artificial intelligence which has come up with those, um, with those answers. I'm not sure I've got a lot to add. <laughs> Sally, um... <laughs> I'm not sure a... I've got a lot to add to that. Sally, do you have any further thoughts yeah. on how it could be used? Um, uh, not really. <laughs> I think, um, <laughs> I think uh, but I do, one of, one of the things I do want to sort of add, and, and I hope it, it does um, somewhat talk to, to you, but I, I think the answers that have, that have been generated there are absolutely right. You know, this uh, talking about matchmaking and, and, you know, the opportunity to, to identify valid suppliers who will gen genuinely bring innovation to the United Kingdom, that's got to be a good thing. So having the ability to open our eyes a little bit more. I think we've got to remember that we're, start we're not starting from a position here where we humans are perfect. And, you know, we, we look at generative AI and think, gosh, you know, what's it going to do? And, you know, how... <laughs> How good is it going to be? And you know, is it going to be um, appropriate in more complex environments? Well, actually, my personal view is yes. It, it's, it is absolutely, it, it has its use case in those more complex environments as well. Um, and, and it's really important for us to remember, and there, there are story after story after story of human frailty in public procurement that, that have you know, really damaged outcomes so um, do you want to come in Kate? I, I'll just respond briefly to that it's my understanding that when it comes to direct awards to um, foreign suppliers that we're only about two percent at the moment in terms of central government contracts indirectly I think it's about as in you award it to a company who's actually controlled by a foreign organization it's more like 17 percent on the contracts under 200 million and about 35 on those big bigger contracts going up. So in terms of your question, in terms of where we want it, where we want, you know, what will happen, in my view is it will make it a bit easier for everyone to bid. So that would, you would think, encourage foreign suppliers. I guess the big question that you're probably writing about is, is that what we want or not? And there's obviously been lots of debates going on mm. through the course of the procurement bill and actually mandating UK suppliers for UK business. But actually, that, how, does that, how does that relate to WTO? And do we then become... Do we then have the same thing when we're trying to deliver goods overseas? So I think it's a multifaceted question. I just thought I'd chip in. Thanks. So just a thought on the language point, that, that obviously AI based on an English language corpus, that, that, that's where most of the action is right now. And that is potentially, so I, was, I was just thinking about Estonia as you said that, whether Estonia is uh, doing contracting in English language rather than in Estonian, because uh, that will increase the pool for them. I certainly think this is a really interesting question because it could have a disproportionately beneficial effect for suppliers for whom English is not their first language. And if anyone's worked in a corporate as I have where you've got people uh, who um, I think is second, and uh, the probably people in this room for, where English is their second language, everything's just much harder. Yeah. Uh, and however, however ethical you think you are, uh, um, people discriminate against and discount those who have English yeah. as a second language. So, so if but through this tool you can make sure that yeah. the way you're presenting yourself to a UK government purchaser yeah. is more fluent, uh, I think that's going to have a disproportionately beneficial effect yeah. for those suppliers. Can I, uh, can I just pick up on the kind of uh, the importance of language? There was a question we had um, online said, uh, Meredith Broussard argued that AI um, obfuscates seriously skewed social prejudices by learning that from seriously biased assumptions. <laughs> um, how do you avoid that problem? <laughs> yeah, so... Um, Large and I'm going to specifically talk about large language models. And I, as some people didn't put their hands up for is this an inflection point? Um, it's an inflection point. <laughs> you know, kind of like, uh, large language models are, are very. We've heard a lot about AI over the decades. Yeah. Large language models are something else. This um, this new technology. Uh, they are a cultural technology. So in the same way that a library is a cultural technology, 
And large language models like ours, as I said, they've read everything. They've read everything that's ever been digitized. So not quite everything, but you know, everything that's been digitized. And of course, that then reflects the prejudices and biases of the past. Much like a library, if you've got the British Library, reflects the biases and prejudices of the past in the pages of its books. And of course, if you insensitively pick a book at random and ask it um, for a hero or ask it for, it is, it is going to um, represent the, the historical biases that are inherent in that cultural technology. Um, there are a couple of things you can do about that in libraries. You can burn books um, or you can be rather more sensitive about which books you choose and how you choose them and you can apply a level of intelligence to how you use uh, a library. But in, in AI, I think it, it's much the same with large language models. Um, it, they, they, they do absolutely reflect those biases. There's some very clever maths you can do to start taking out biases. And one of the things we do is in the, the big vector space of meaning in which we operate, if you take a word which is gendered in the corpus, say uh, doctor, would be uh, more associated um, with, with men rather than women, we can just correct for that bias in the, in the math to make sure that it isn't uh, a gendered word in our, in our corpus. So there's, there's clever stuff you can do, but the, 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 the big picture is you need to be cognizant that there is bias in the training mm -hmm. data, mm -hmm. there is bias in our history, and you need to use that cultural technology as you would use other cultural technologies with an eye to that bias and with an eye to making the future world better than the past world it was trained on. And I wanted to come to you next. Um, someone's asked, can AI remove subjectivity from bid evaluations? So I, first, I guess, firstly, do you think there is subjectivity uh, in bid evaluations? And if so, do you think this technology could help remove those? Um, it's a bit of a copper, but I'm going to say maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and I, but I'll, I'll explain that. So as, as I opened up, uh, I mentioned earlier, I think the way we currently are thinking of AI, um, we don't believe it's going to be replacing bid evaluation, for example, or, or drafting bids from a supplier perspective, but we think it could be used to augment it. Um, so is there subjectivity? So when it comes to the early uh, phases of the evaluation, as I said, a lot of it is, is frankly, tick boxing. It's important ones because it, it tells us that the supplier is capable, it tells us who they are, it tells us that they're you know, a registered legal entity. And so, so important things that we need to establish. I think certainly in those, in, in those type of early stages, I can see uh, probably early, uh, um, as soon as we start adopting it, um, I, I think we can, we can use AI. Is that subjective? I would argue not. Um, there, there are subjective elements in the evaluation and then the selection of bids uh, in the sense that people are subjective. So people have perceptions. Uh, and uh, we, at the moment, historically, we've used people to evaluate bids. It's just as simple as that. We use certain techniques to ensure that that subjectivity doesn't unduly um, uh, uh, award a bid inappropriately. But I don't think subjectivity, in its essence, is a negative. Is, is a negative, uh, but we need to ensure that it's not uh, inappropriately used. So for example, we use multiple evaluators. That's just something mm -hmm. that we we all do, and that's not in, only in government. I mean, I've I've worked most of my most of my professional life in actually in the private sector. So we use multiple uh, evaluators for that. We've got things like conflict of interest and so on and so forth. Now, will AI help us reduce that? I think to, to certain elements, yes. However, what we shouldn't forget, and I, I meant to mention it earlier on, we need to be careful, I think, in this discussion not to go down a rabbit hole because uh, today, and I can see that in the future as well, I, I think for a large proportion, certainly of the complex type commodity uh, 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 goods and services, I wouldn't expect it to simply be um, us awarding only based on written submissions. Mm. We extensively use, and we will continue using that, would be my prediction, other ways of evaluating uh, suppliers' capability, whether they're from uh, international, whether they are, they're, they're UK-based. Um, we use supplier days, we use demonstrations, we use site visits, and so on and so forth. 
and that is part of our qualitative assessment of the bid. Is really, and what are we trying to do there? We're trying to really get to the bottom of, can, is this the right partner for us? Yep. Do they have the capability? Do they have the capacity? Is what they've written mm -hmm. on the paper, is that really true? Mm -hmm. Can they do the job? That's really what we're trying, and, and I don't see us, uh, uh, I don't see AI replacing those side, side visits. At least not. No, definitely, <laughs> At least not no, now. No, definitely not. Absolutely. Yes. And they say that subjectivity. These are humans buying human services. It's good that humans are making that decision. Those are the ones we want to be making it. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go to another round of um, questions from the audience. Uh, so if you have a question, yeah, over here, uh, and then over here by the door. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sofia Ginatidou, and I'm leading on AI policy for the ICO, the UK Data Protection Authority. And I'm also working with other three regulators uh, at the Digital Regulation Cooperation Forum. So this is an initiative we have co-founded with the FCA, the CMA, and Ofcom. And actually today we released a report on transparency in algorithmic procurement that touches upon those issues that we're discussing today. And I think one of the findings in the report is that... Sorry, can I ask you to come to a question? Yes. <laughs> Quickly, thank you. The que one of the findings was that vendors uh, quite often do not have access to the information they need to, to actually understand whether or not what they're procuring is complying with UK regulation. And I'm just wondering, in, in practical terms, how, where do you think the data science expertise needs to resign within government in order to actually scrutinize the tenders that you're receiving? Thank you. Uh, and then by the door. So the question that I have is, um, considering that we're speaking about chat GPT, um, large language models are trained upon vast data sets of uh, human and creative work throughout centuries. How do we ensure that this huge language model serves the common and belongs to the common as opposed to being privatized by large um, private uh, organizations that are after profit? Great, okay, uh, two very good questions there. Um, and I might come to you first on where the data science expertise needs to lie. Well, as I said, um, and I'm, I'm always honest, we are very much in discovery mode. Do we have the, uh, the expertise that we're gonna need? Um, frankly, not, no. not yet. Um, but am I worried about it? Um, not yet, because it's not yet extensively used, but we absolutely are aware that we need to get those expertise in place. We've got you know, people who are looking out at this and other technology, because this AI is not the only technology out there that potentially could, could or is very likely to disrupt the way we do things. Um, so I'm confident that we, we will get there. Um, clearly, we need to get there sooner rather than later, so we have those expertise before the technology is, is widely used. But we are, I, I, I think as part of the process we're going through, we will get there, I'm confident we will. Uh, so I'm not overly anxious about it, uh, uh, but, but yes, I agree, we, we, we need to ensure we've got the right people at the right place that can uh, utilize as opposed <coughs> to being taken advantage by the technology. Thank you. Uh, Richard, I'll come to you next. Yeah, just, so I think both questions sort of touch on the future regulation aspect. And um, I would just, as a sort of general rule, I'd say I think we need to focus on what we're, what do we want? What does good look like? And I think, you know, good looks like um, uh, open, transparent, fair processes that match up, in, in this space anyway, that match up the right people with the, the right businesses. It could be delivered by private organisations, it could be delivered by public organisations, but the, the critical thing is that we define what we want as the outcome. And the example I uh, always go back to of doing it the wrong way is the cookie banner, which we all experience day in, day out, which I was involved in the process at the time. The European Union wanted to regulate online behavioural advertising. They didn't say we want less online behavioural advertising in the regulation, they said let's regulate these things called cookies. And we've ended up with something which has done nothing to restrict online behavioral advertising, but it irritates people every day of the week and probably has a, from the ICA point of view, a privacy net negative point of view because it's trained people to click things. So avoiding that model for AI, I think, is going to be critical. And I think the single most important thing is defining what 
do we want at the end of all of this? And then you work back from there and say, okay, what regulation do we need? Does it, does it require things to be put into a public commons or not? Or can, you know, can we achieve our goal without that question? Uh, can we achieve our goal um, with certain use of data? Because I think ICO is going to get pulled into a lot of this stuff. There's a whole, whole world of pain around copyright law. Uh, that, that we need to, you know, and again, there's a question there. Do we think the people who own the large AI models should be paying license fees to people or not? That's the real question. And let's sort of work back from having made that political decision to what regulation do we need? But yeah, so we're at the beginning of that, but the only, my only plea is let's define what we want at the end of this. In the context of today's discussion, I actually want uh, uh, better procurement. And I think AI has got a critical role to play in, in making sure we get better value for public services. Again, again I don't know um, who should deliver that, but I think we should be starting with that point and then working back. I so, think um, one of the important yeah. things here is, uh, and I, I did touch on it before, is creating the right partnerships so the expertise doesn't exist in government right now. I think let's be honest about that. It does not exist that it, to the extent that it needs to. Um, you're not just gonna buy in a whole bunch of expertise tomorrow. That's not going to, to happen either. So identifying the right organizations and, you know, newsflash, that's not the mega big consultancies where government traditionally goes for support. Um, I think government needs to be far more effective at identifying true experts in this field um, and partnering with them effectively and being on that journey of discovery and learning then where the, the expertise needs to be embedded within, you know, within different government departments and different functions. Um, so I think you know, this, is, this is a journey. We all, need, we all need to accept the fact that we are learning together but it, it is important that we do. It's really important that we're having these conversations. I think um, Institute for Government are fantastic for putting on an, a session like this and allowing this discussion and debate to happen because we need to do this. We need to be open. Mm. We need to be transparent with one another. Um, and we need to find the right partnerships then to avoid some of what, and I, I'm going to let Sean answer your question, but, um, but some of what um, you know, you're, you, you're talking to in your question. So I agree with this part, partially. Um, I agree we, we're not going to um, want to develop uh, these capabilities wholly in-house. However, we do need to have a sufficiently intelligent client to yes, manage. Yes, of course, absolutely. Yeah. Now, that's in theory really simple. The reality is complex. So government, um, and this is a much wider discussion that's going on within government. It's been going on for many, many years, which is really around skills. Mm -hmm. So we've got, uh, we've got um, certainly a, a number of areas where we, we need to be stronger on skills. So, you know, program management, mm -hmm. we buy that in, but really we should be much, much stronger. And we know that uh, around delivery of programs. Digital, AI is part of digital, frankly. Um, are we always at the forefront of digital development? Well, we're looking to develop that. But clearly, that element of it will be uh, are still outsourced. But we absolutely need to beef up our internal ability from digital, procurement, commercial, and so on and so forth. So this is part of, I think, a much bigger picture of how do we get the right skills into government? Yeah, and, sure. and are we learning from others who have already been you know, a further absolutely. ahead in the path from us? Sean, we are running out of time. So I'm going to come to you for a, a final word on some of those big questions. Yeah, look, I think on large language models, I think they become commoditized. I think that the cost of training them and the cost of the computing power just is coming down and down. And actually, you'll start to see a world where OpenAI have got one and uh, Google have got one and there's a whole load of open source models. So uh, I, think, I think that's what happens in, the, in that space. And the interesting stuff then happens at the, the sort of software level, essentially, kind of um, uh, above that. Uh, look, I'd, I'd, I'd go to... Um, Procurement is a, is a particular application of what this is going to be a world-changing technology. Bill Gates did a, a blog the other day uh, talking about the kind of the wow moments he's had in his life of the, uh, sort of, first of all, the graphic user interface, right, which they built kind of um, word on, uh, and, and, and indeed kind of the whole of modern computing. Uh, and then a session he did with OpenAI where they showed him some of the power of these large language 
uh, model. So this, this tech is going to change everything. We are linguistic creatures. Computers could add up faster than us. Now they can do language faster than us. That is a profound change for humanity. And in a world of procurement where words are incredibly important, words that represent reality, but the, the production of those words and helping people to articulate those solutions, that is going to be quite profound for, for all of us. Thank you. Well, on that note, I'm going to bring the discussion to a close. I'd like to thank our five panel uh, panellists for an absolutely fascinating discussion that we could have continued for a, a lot longer. Uh, thank Autogen II for supporting the event, uh, and to thanks to all those uh, who've watched today, either in person uh, or online or watching back later. Um, our next event uh, will be another digital event, which is Data Bytes number 40, uh, which is taking place on Wednesday, the 5th of April at 6 p.m. So do tune in for that as well. Until then, thank you very much and goodbye.